Let's finish the fig wine. All right, so this has been sitting since July 27th. Today is August 12th, which doesn't mean a whole lot to you because you're going to see this later on. But that means there's been about 15 days, 16 days. So it's pretty good. You, as you can see, the airlock is not really moving much anymore, which we always do say that airlock activity or lack thereof does not mean that fermentation is complete. It just means that it may have slowed down. It may have altered course. There could be a leak. There could be a lot of reasons. So I'm just going to take this lid off. And I also want to, full disclosure, I have opened this pretty much almost every day, maybe every other day at worst and push that bag around because it just would not stay in. Had I put a weight in there, I might have gotten it to stay down better. But because it's still producing gas, it worked as just enough of a balloon to hold in all those gases and it kept floating to the surface. So there was really no two ways about it. But now I want to get that bag out of there because I think the fruit's done its thing and it's done and we're going to take our first reading. Plus this bag takes up so much space in here. You can't, you can't do anything else, but it's, it's messy. Look at this. This is just crazy. Oh yeah. As I'm feeling this, those figs just, they're mush. It's, it's complete mush. I'm giving the bag a bit of a squeeze to get some of the liquid out. <laughs> Cause if I don't, there'll, there'll be no brew left. And you notice I have here a large bowl. Well, actually Derek, I did it, but we have a large bowl and a colander because this is going to drain for a while and we're going to salvage whatever comes out of it. We're not going to throw that away. As you can see, there's quite a bit coming out now. Okay. And now I'm going to wash my hands again. All right. So now that we have the bag removed and again, you can leave the bag in longer as long as there's no fear of it getting uh, moldy or anything like that. In this case, I was starting to get a little bit nervous that it might because I would have to continually keep wetting it every day, every two days. And if this went on for another month, that's a little bit tedious and not the kind of thing that I want to do. The fact that it disintegrated the fruit that much means they've given up all they're going to give up. I don't think we'd get much more out of it by leaving it in longer. So I think we're good and we're going to move on from there. Next, I want to get its initial reading, which is not its initial reading, but its first of its final readings. Yeah, something like that. For that, we use the Todd. May have to come up with a better name. And nobody gets the reference because somebody just said we should name it Todd. So I call it the Todd. Well, there's more than one reference for it. So it's okay to still call it the Todd. Yeah. Because the Todd is what the character in uh, the Doctor sitcom referred to himself as the Todd. The Doctor sitcom. <sighs> oh, oh, in Scrubs. Scrubs, thank you. Well, in that case, we should name it the Chad. It'd be like in Charlie's Angels. So this brew started out at 1.050. That's what I have on my records. But because of the fruit that was not extracted in that number, I estimated it at about a 1.095. We will never know if that is going to be fully extracted or not, so it's going to be somewhat of an approximation for its final ABV. But we can calculate when it finishes, and that's the important aspect. And right now, it is at 1.002, which means it's probably finished fermenting, but I'm still going to give it a little bit more time. I am going to pour the sample back in very carefully. Notice how you're not really hearing it. You're not seeing much, but there is still a lot of gas in here. So I'm not all that concerned because I still have quite a bit of liquid in here that's going to go in there too. And oxidization is something to be concerned with, okay? Since this has alcohol in it already, we do want to be careful, but here's the thing. You can get crazy worrying about tiny little minutia and you'll never make a brew. You'll end up wasting a lot of product because you're afraid it might oxidize. We have had like no oxidization problems ever. So maybe we we're just lucky. I don't know. But because of that, I don't get crazy about little things like pouring the sample back in. So all that's left for today is we're going to squeeze out this bag a little bit, get some more of this juice out because there's there's a significant amount in here still. That's that's impressive. Probably a couple of cups of liquid still. Now, I don't want to squeeze so hard that I get solids coming through, but, you know, I don't want to waste it either. 
Before anybody asks, yes, my hands were dunked in a sanitizer liquid, so they're as clean as they can be expected to be in this scenario. And if we really did start with like a 1.095 uh, gravity, this is something like 12 to 13 percent alcohol already. So yeah, and now that Brian is squeezing the bag, I smell the alcohol. It it almost smells like paint thinner. It's it's very it smells alcohol very strong. smelly. Yeah, this is this is really young. And it smells of alcohol. Like, it just smells like alcohol, period. Paint thinner might be a little strong. But, you know, <laughs> I, I, I see what she, where she's coming from. Okay, that's all I care to do. We need an extra bowl for transference, don't we? We do. And I also have to wash my hands. Again. Hey, you're Rocky! Now, the moment you've all been waiting for. Watch me pull a rabbit out of my hat. No, I'm just kidding. You're going to watch me pour from this bowl into the, into the fermenter. By having the lip that way, hopefully I can do this well. The trick is, I don't want to pour it too fast because I don't want to splash it, but I also don't want to spill it everywhere. So, this gets tricky. You may want to look away. Okay, it's a little harsher of a pour than I'd really care for. But that was a lot of wine that would have been wasted had I not done that. Another word about pouring and oxidization, okay? Normally you want to use a siphon whenever possible. You want to cover it up like she's doing right now as quickly as possible to prevent exposure to oxygen. But I'm going to show you guys something in just a second that'll help put a little bit of that fear to rest as soon as I can get the seals to line up. There we go takes forever. There's just a lot of threads in there. Okay. Oxidization happens when your must is exposed to air. Now, it does two things. One is it makes off flavors, and that's usually the most common worry, even though the other one is what everybody says. The real worry is off flavors. The other worry is activating acetobacter. Acetobacter is what creates acetic acid, also known as vinegar. However, because this is over 10% already, vinegarization is probably not as likely to happen. And like I said, we've never had off flavors due to oxidization before, except in extraordinarily rare cases, like when we had this much mead left in a mason jar sitting on the shelf for about two years. Yeah, it got oxidized and didn't taste so good anymore. Go figure. Yeah. <laughs> but in this situation, here's why I'm not super worried. Any oxygen that might have got in there, if I just do this now, watch that airlock. There's so much CO2 in solution in this brew. And since CO2 is heavier than oxygen, oxygen is lighter, so it's going to go to the top and get forced out that airlock. So all I have to do is a little bit of swirling it around. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna make a mess, it's bubbling. It's all right. I am making sure I get all that oxygen out of there so that nobody accuses me of oxidizing my brew. Okay, I'm doing this on purpose, overdoing it to prove a point. It's really, really hard to mess something up in this situation. This is when we have a little subtext that says dramatization for effect. Yeah, no kidding, but <laughs> you get the idea. And this will start bubbling for a little while. It'll probably degas for a while, and that's a good thing. I like to let things naturally degas. Some people will say, oh, you should be degassing now. And you can, you totally can if you want to. There's a lot of ways, there's, there's always the, you can do this, but we do it this way. And it's not a, this is the only way, or this is the right way. It's, this is how we're doing it. How you do it in your own situation could be very, very different. And it could be for any number of reasons. We have a show to make, for one. So when this is done, I got two more brews to make today. I don't really have time to sit there and do the full degassing and everything. Plus, I know this is going to sit for a few weeks. Because look at it. That's about as clear as mud. I want it to clear up. Therefore, there's no rush to degas this right away because I know it's going to have to clear away anyway. So why bother? And it's more effort. To me, the least amount that I can mess with a brew, the better. Now, keep in mind, that's what I said. The least messing with, the better. I used to say this all the time, and I haven't said it in a long time. But mead wants to make itself. We just have to get the heck out of the way. So I'm going to put this on a shelf and get the heck out of the way and let it do its thing. And we'll be back in a, probably a couple weeks with the next installment. Eight days have gone by. Let's check this again. Make sure it's really done and maybe we'll rack it. The fruit's been removed because 
That would be a long time. And it was like really getting up in there. And, yeah. Lots of threads on these little big mouth bubblers. That's a good thing though. I smell ethanol, but I also smell like raisiny fruit. That's a good thing. So what I want to do is take a reading, which means I use the Todd, also known as a syringe with a piece of tubing. So everything was sanitized and we use star sand to do that. So that way we can be reasonably sure there's not going to be any infections or nastiness going on because we do have this open to the air right now, but it takes quite a bit. It's not like it's going to happen in just a few seconds of exposure. The things we're trying to do now is avoid extra air and oxygen getting to it. When we last checked, this was 1.002. And it is still 1.002. So that means not only is it done fermenting, it's time to rack, okay? So that means it's finished. We take two readings at least a week apart. These were, yeah, eight days. And that way, if it doesn't change over that week, you're reasonably sure it's done. Now, if your reading is like 1.080, it's probably not done. It's probably stalled. A little bit of um, common sense and math has to come into play. This started at 1.095-ish approximation with all the fruit added, and we're at 1.002. I'm going to assume that that's finished. Most brews, it's a little more cut and dry than that, though. So let me pour some into a glass here, because, you know, it's always good to take a little sample. That's a larger sample than I really meant, but whatever. And the rest I'm going to pour into our pitcher, which I'm going to use the pitcher for volumization. Um, that way I know what size fermenter to put this in for conditioning or, well, you know, some people call it secondary fermentation. Before we get to that, though, let's just take a quick taste of this. Yeah, on the smell, it smells of a... Uh, ooh, what is that smell? It smells young still, I'll be honest. Um, this was started... Yeah, this is, this is just over like six weeks. Coming up on seven weeks. There's definitely an ethanol smell. There's definitely a little bit of a raisiny smell, a dark fruit smell. Yeah, I'm getting more plum than I'm getting fig on the scent. It's unique and different. I will give it that. It's 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 not like other things that we've we've drank before. Did we put any acid in this? No. This because is I'm... raisins, honey, and dried figs. Oh, there's lemon peel, lemon juice. Ah, yeah, we did. Okay. Lemon peel, lemon juice, black tea. Because I'm definitely getting that acid sensation more than the flavor i'm getting a sensation mm -hmm. um i think this actually worked really really well it's not a flavor profile that i like at this moment but i want to let this sit for a little bit so we're going to rack it and i think we might be back sweetening i'm pretty sure we will 1.002 it's very very dry i think this might need a little bit to counteract a little bit of the tannic tannic effect that i'm tasting and the acid that she's getting making it balanced that's the whole thing plus we like things just a little bit sweet too so so we use dry figs for this yes we did do we want to add some more dry figs in conditioning or secondary because we've noticed adding a dry uh fruit after primary fermentation is complete, tends to give it that more complexity. A richer flavor. I'm not really getting that dry fruit essence. I'm, I'm not this. against that idea. Um, let's see what we have for space, and okay. we'll go from there. So okay. we're gonna we're gonna rack this. All right, so we have it racked, and we have pretty much a full gallon. So Derica washed out the little big mouth bubbler, and we ha have here a pound of dried figs. I didn't have any fresh ones, so we're gonna use dried. And I'm using a pound because it just looks like a lot. But that means got to use a bag again. And that's why we're using a little big mouth bubbler because it's so much easier. So let me just cut these up, throw them in the bag, be back with you. Okay, so we have all of our figs put into a bag. But we're 
Sarah's going to add one of these. This is a fermentation weight, and that's going to help keep our bag submerged. Yeah, because the trick is you do not want this to sit at the top. And now, since there shouldn't be a lot of off-gassing anymore, because, you know, it's done fermenting, I would expect that, um, you know, there's going to be some oxygen there. We don't want bad things. So I'm going to try to tie this guy up now so it doesn't have a long tail to float. The thing you want to keep in mind when you're using a fermentation weight is that that is a large hunk of heavy glass. Don't just drop it. So you want to gently place that in you know, your... Like that. Yeah. And now what we're going to do is rack this back onto here. And we have videos on racking. That's why we're not showing it, trying to speed these up just a little bit more. And now we replace the lid by getting the threads just right. There we go. And we are putting an airlock back on this because it's always a good idea. Um, that way, if it decided it wanted to ferment more because we did just put fruit in there, it can off gas and there's no worries about explosions or anything of the sort. And um, this way too, if it is just off gassing by itself, it has somewhere to go. There's just no harm in putting it on there and it's always a good idea. So you may be asking yourself, well, what about your gravity reading? Well, see, at this point, oh, well. <laughs> that gravity reading isn't going to be very helpful because yes, there are sugars in those figs, but no, those sugars have not been released into the liquid. So even if we took a gravity reading at this point, it's not going to be reflective of the sugars that we added. Right, exactly. There's no way to know. And the other thing is, if this doesn't re-ferment, a new gravity reading just really doesn't make much difference because it's not going to change the alcohol by volume or anything like that. And remember, this brew, we actually took a reading of 1.050, but because of all the fruit that we added, it was approximately 1.095. We don't actually know. So this one is kind of a very much a maybe, if then, sort of, almost kind of thing. In the range of. Yeah. So we're not going to get too crazy about it. And it's good to know when it's finished. This is a great example of knowing when your brew is finished rather than knowing exactly how much alcohol it has. Because we know it went down to 1.002, which means it was done. It wasn't stalled. It was done. But... The 1.002 didn't mean it's finished, by the way. Two readings over a week period meant it was finished. But now, if we see that this changes again, okay, now we have to let it sit that much longer. But um, You might notice that there's activity in the airlock, and that's because we didn't degas this before we did all the additions. Mm -hmm. And simply moving it from one vessel to vessel has activated. It's been agitated. And it is degassing now, which is a good sign because that means it's pushing all the oxygen out because the carbon dioxide is heavier than the oxygen. So we have the carbon dioxide blanket and don't have to worry about any unwanted things happening to our brew. Anyway, this is going to sit for a while, and um, we'll be back in probably a couple weeks to show you where it's at. All right, so after the catastrophe with the audio, <laughs> it's been nine more days, and this has been sitting. There's the occasional bubble coming out, but I do believe that's degassing at this point. However, there's only one way to know for sure, and that is take this lid off. The endless threaded lid. And I'm going to take a reading. And by take a reading, I'm going to take a hydrometer reading, just like we've done a million times. You've seen this, even in this video. So I have a question for you. Did we use... We did not use the Herculometer on this one. Okay, so I should get the... Or, yeah, we didn't say if we did or not. That's the Herculometer, so... Yeah, we didn't say if we did or not. Okay. We started this back on 720. We didn't have one yet. Okay, so let me get the other one. Okay. And this is a good point for you at home. This is our Herculometer. It's our new favorite thing ever. But when it comes to hydrometers, you want to try to stick to the same hydrometer because there or is that little bit of variance in their readings and their calibrations. And that way, if you have the same tool that you're using throughout, that variance doesn't matter because you're using the same tool. Make sense? Yes, Hopefully. exactly. That 
All right, and as usual, I like to put the hydrometer into the cylinder first. It makes it a little bit easier. I'm going to study the base of that and, and hold we have this in there. The super sucker, <laughs> formerly known as the Todd. If anybody has a better idea, that's probably a little bit more G-rated. Um, we'll we're open to suggestions. And that will go into here. I want to get it as low as I can so that I don't oxidize. What that means is to add too much air to the must. We want to keep as little air as possible. Now, last time it was at 1.018. This time we're just barely floating at 1.004. At this point, my advice is always wait longer. Okay, give it another week. However, I'm reasonably certain this is finished, and here's why. If I start looking at some of the numbers that we have for this, and this is a, also a great way to figure out how to do a step feed, because technically this became a step feed. Okay, so I approximated our original gravity because of the original dried figs at 1.095. That went to 1.002. So that gives me a 0 0.093, right? And then from there, it actually went up to 1.018, and today it's at 1.004. I know that's a lot of numbers, but it was 0 0.014, so plus 0 0.014 gives us 0 0.107 of total gravity spent. So let me go over that again. We had our original gravity, initial final gravity, at, subtract those. Then it went up to 1.018 and back down to 1.004, so you subtract those. Add those two numbers together, that's your total number of gravity points used. Multiply that by 135, and we get 14.445% ABV. So I'm going to call that 14.5%. And we used? We used 71B, which is a 14 to 15% tolerance. I'm going to go with, this is at the yeast tolerance, which means it's done. Now, if I wanted to be 100% or 100,000% safe, I would wait another week and take another reading. If you're still new at brewing, I suggest doing that, especially when it's this kind of close. But in reality, it's only a couple more points that it can possibly go. And we really want to show you guys this video. So <laughs> we're going to do this. It might be rushing it just ever so slightly, but it's only really four, maybe six points maximum that it could do something. Being so close to the tolerance, I think it's okay. So since we're at that stage, that probably means you want a tasting glass. Yes, I do. All right, so as she said, tasting glass, we're just gonna put a little bit of this into the glass and take a little sip. Now, right off the bat, this is crystal clear. It looks really dark in here, you can't see it. Yep. Whoops. But in the glass, <laughs> it is super clear and it's got a really nice... Sorry. It's all right. <laughs> It looks like bourbon. It really does. It doesn't smell like bourbon, though. It smells a little harsher than I might like it to. Go ahead and give that a, give that a swift. Um, it's got a strong, astringent almost flavor or smell to it. It's not vinegar in any way. Yeah. I think it's just very young, which it is. You know, this was started on July 27th. Today is, is September not, um, 8th. So... Yeah, this is like six weeks old. I don't find its aroma offensive. Okay, that's a, that's a good sign. It's going to be quite dry, so probably that mouth puckering thing. It's like dry and sweet at the same time. Yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> I expected a harsh, astringent, bitter, rough brew. It's smooth and rich. It's actually really nice. I'd like it to be a little sweeter, though. Yeah. So we are going to sweeten this, but first, let's get it racked. Okay, racking is just moving the liquid from this vessel to something else. Now, I'm going to be putting it in a pitcher because we are going to be doing some back sweetening, and there is a little bit of lease in the bottom here. Um, lease, lease, however you want to say it. Um, apparently, lease is the correct way. I've been saying it lease for, like, my whole life, so that's the way I'm going to say it. Um, but there is some here, so I don't want to mix that into the brew. So we are going to rack it to the pitcher first and then go from there. But if you want to see the full process on how to rack, we have a video that I'll link there and in the description below. 
Uh, but for now, we'll get right to it and be back with you. So as you can see in the bottom here, we have a little bit of, well... Sludge. Yeah. Wastage, lease, whatever you want to call it. It was getting kind of nasty, and this is like a really creamy sludge is the best way to say it. So I didn't want that in the brew. I didn't want that at the bottom of our bottles. So I stopped just a hair faster so that nothing got into our brew. But we did end up with, oh, it looks like 120 uh, fluid ounces, which is about 3,500 milliliters, you know, like 3.5 liters. And that's why we like this pitcher because it tells us exactly what we have. And that way, when we go to bottle, we know how many we need. This is gonna be about four and a half bottles worth. Now that half bottle isn't a problem because for us, we're gonna do a tasting very soon after, not really a problem. But now we have an issue. We decided that we want this to actually be a little sweeter than what it actually is. So we have options at this point. One of those options is we could add in a fermentable sugar, such as honey or sugar or some of the... There's tons of things you could add. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But when you add a fermentable sugar, that means the There's yeasties that are still in there might get excited and go, hey, it's a party. Let's ferment some more. Now, I did say earlier that I believe this is at or very close to the tolerance of yeast, but I don't know for a fact. And the yeast can't read. They don't know that they're close to their tolerance. They may get reactivated with more sugar and start up again. We don't want that to happen. So our option is if we decided to go ahead and add fermentable sugar, then we would want to pasteurize so that way we could neutralize the yeasts that are in there, killing them with heat, death by fire, and then we could have a stable brew once again. Or we can go to option B, which is to add an unfermentable sugar as a sweetening agent that the yeast won't eat. Now, something really important about that. These are like erythritol, allulose, things like that. These are artificial sweeteners. Now, I don't actually like to ingest these as a food in a brew. Eh, you know, I'm not taking in all that much. It's okay. The reason I don't is on the other channel. <laughs> it's a whole long story. We won't even get into it here. There is no actual medical anything saying that they are bad for you. I just want that to be clear. Um, just for my condition, they don't, they don't seem to help me much. They don't so, play well with Brian. Yeah. So... <sighs> The main reason why we're showing you this this option is for your benefit so that way if you decided you want to do this this is how you do it so let's get to it okay just like when we back sweeten using honey or sugar or anything else back sweetening is to taste people ask all the time how much sugar should i use to back sweeten well that really depends on what you have to start with and what you like and what you want that brew to be because two different brews can require different amounts of back sweetening to taste the way you want them. Now, something that we do though, is we know this is young and it's going to mellow. So we tend to keep it a little bit under the actual sweetness level that we might really prefer. And instead just go with that tastes pretty nice. It'll get better with age. So basically what I'm saying is I'm going to measure the amount that I put in, but the amount that I put in might be different from the amount that you would prefer. And I'm just going to use cups because it's so much easier than trying to get the scale out and all that kind of thing. So I'm just going to start with a half cup of erythritol, which erythritol counts as about two thirds as sweet as sugar. So this would be like adding two thirds of a cup of sugar. Keep in mind, if you do opt to add sugar, you're probably going to have to pasteurize or stabilize this somehow. Just remember that. OK, that's why we're doing it this way. So I'm going to put in the half cup. That might be all I need. I don't really know. And I just want to mix it in. Now, one thing, erythritol does actually mix in fairly quickly. And look at that. It's degassing. That's another aspect that happens here is we might actually foam over, but I'm going to be careful. Yeah, you you created the... Uh... Mm -hmm. It's the, uh, the Mentos and Diet Coke effect. <laughs> Cavitation. Oh, wow. Yeah, that, you can probably hear it. There's a layer of foam on top. But this is good. We wanted to degas anyway. So this is two birds, one stone, that sort of thing. What you don't want to do while you're mixing is slosh it around because at this point you can oxidize this. We don't want to oxidize this. That can create some off flavors. It is at the very close to 15% mark where Acetobacter really cannot make vinegar anymore. So that's not so much an issue, but oxidation can cause off flavors and make it taste kind of weird over time. 
the goal here is to let the gas go out without getting more gas in. Right. It's because I am prone to knocking things over. I'm going to seal this up. Just have a feeling I don't want erythritol all over the kitchen. And let's just let's just set it like over there. And I'm just I have this mixed up pretty well. I'm just going to pour a little sample. Now, the, wow, it actually is still quite clear. Yeah. That's cool. See, when you use real sugar and honey, honey especially, it'll cloud it right up. It'll clear out eventually, but it clouds it up immediately. I think it needs more. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think it needs more. I think it actually needs significantly more. So this time, instead of putting a half, I'm going to put a whole cup in. Wouldn't you agree? It doesn't taste like it did much. So two more half cups. That's why I start with a half cup because you almost can't overdo it with a half cup. Um, but had I started with a whole cup and it was too sweet, you can't take it back out. But now I see it needs a significant amount. It still has that really interesting underlying sweet note. Yeah. Just naturally, which. I want to bring it out more. Makes me wonder what's going to happen with this with aging if it's going to get incredibly sweet i don't think so I don't know. we seem to have degassed effectively not really seeing any more coming out and the reason you degas or want to if you if you have to is it gets rid of some of the stale flavors created during fermentation you know some of those bubbles have been sitting in there for six or seven weeks so you want to get rid of that that way you're not storing it with all that CO2, which can actually make things taste bitter all on its own. And don't mistake that for carbonation. That's a different thing. It is technically carbonated, but it's not really the way you want it to. When be. you do a controlled carbonation, it's it's controlled by the <laughs> by the name and it's it's a fresher process. So mm -hmm. it's not as aged and stale and funkified. <laughs> funkified. There you go. That's the technical term. Oops, that was a little bit more than I wanted to. Ooh. It's getting nice. Mm -hmm. The harsh note has gone down quite a bit. That sweetness is coming back. It doesn't taste like figs, but it does definitely taste like a dried fruit. It's hard to say what it is though. But I don't get fig per se. What do you think? I'm concerned about going much sweeter because I think it is going to smooth out with age. But that's just projecting. At most, I would so. say another half cup. I don't, I don't think any more than a half cup would be appropriate. Before I make that final determination though, sometimes, you know, you need a second opinion. A little bit more. By the way, the swirling is a habit, but it helps to focus aromas. This has a really interesting aroma. This tastes nice, but there is a, a hint of a bitterness there, an astringency, making me think that a little bit more sweetness might help. Yeah. I know you're worried about mellowing over time, I'm actually, I think another half cup. Yeah. We've seen that a half cup doesn't make a tremendous difference. So I don't think another half is going to really overdo, let's say. Watch, I'll eat my words when I take the reading. It's like 1.06 thousand or something. You know, mm -hmm. It won't be. Seriously. Technically, that's 1.060000. See? It's the same thing. Yeah. 1.060. It's making a point. It's like this all the time. The jokes don't get any better. This stuff really does dissolve fast. Yeah, that's impressive. It's like gone. Sugar takes forever when you do this. Because this is just at room temperature. This isn't heated or anything like that. It is shocking how it stayed clear. That's really cool. One other advantage of the non-fermentable sugar. Go ahead. A 
I think it's nice. I like it. It's not my absolute favorite mead we've ever made. I'll be totally honest. It's uh, or fig. It's not even mead. It's not my favorite thing we've ever made, but it's actually quite good. Um, I do actually detect the honey though. That's why I'm calling it mead. It's not mead. Most of the fermentables is actually from the raisins and figs, um, not the honey itself. So that's why we call this a wine. But definitely has a little bit of honey character to it. And I think using erythritol as the sweetener kept it more neutral that way mm -hmm. so that you get the that dried fruit flavor along with the uh, sweetness. It's actually pretty cool. It's funny, comparing the different tastes that we've taken along the way, it actually doesn't taste sweeter as it tastes less bitter. Yes. So yes. That's, that's very curious. Yeah, it had a really um, nail polish remover, rip your face off kind of harshness early on. I wasn't that, getting the nail polish sensation. Just to rip your face I, off. Yeah. Just, just the face. Just to rip your face off, yeah. <laughs> um, now it's actually really nice. It's, it's quite pleasant. And I think with six months to a year of aging, this is going to be wonderful. So we are going to do an immediate tasting to give our full impressions on it in, a, in the next video. But for now, we're going to bottle this. If you're not sure how to bottle, we actually have an entire video on that process. Go watch that. We'll still be here. So we got five full bottles, which is, that's the advantage of using the little big mouth bubbler that way. It's a 1.4 gallon fermenter. So we can really put in heavy fruits and things like that. And at the end, still get a full one gallon of brew. Now, the reason why we actually didn't get four and a half bottles and we got five is because I added two cups of erythritol. That takes up some volume, apparently about eight ounces. So that made it five full bottles. And you'll notice some of these have just slightly more. There was a little tiny bit at the end. So I had to fill a little bit more. But in general, this is pretty much where you want it to be. I pull the uh, stopper out when it's about here so that, boom, it stops. And that is the displacement of the actual um, bottling, bottling wand. wand. That's the word, bottling wand. Um, someone asked, is that too much headspace? Okay. Yes and no. I see where they're going. This is better than this. Okay, see how little headspace there is? However... You have to look at actual surface area. The amount of surface area isn't really any different. Only this much is exposed, this much of it is exposed to oxygen, just like here, that much of it. If it was down here, it's this much being exposed. That's the main thing to be concerned with. So your with. goal is to get it at least this far. Right. If you can go higher, far. by all means. It's just when you're using a bottling wand, not always that simple because that is literally the displacement. You can try to go a couple more drops up to the top, but it's actually really difficult. What I ended up having to do was emptied out the tubing and the wand to get that little bit more into both of those bottles, just what was left in the tube. Literally like a tablespoon or two. That was about all it really is. But anyway, next up, next video, we're going to be tasting this. And one of these is going to go away for a whole year. And a year from now, you will see another tasting where we give our impressions of it at that point. But hey, see these people over here? That's our bejesus and plaid level VIPs. These people, along with all the rest of the VIP group membership of our channel, keep this channel alive and keep it going, letting us keep producing content just like this. If you like this video, look, look up. up. Another one up there? You might like that one too. Thanks for watching.